What's up guys, I'm Nobody Special, and unfortunately the war drums are beating pretty loud in Eastern Europe and in the Middle East right now, and even though our leaders are trying to go the diplomatic route, they're accomplishing a whole bunch of nothing at the negotiating table, and it's looking more and more like energy is going to be used as a weapon if things light off. And there's a lot of these individual stories going on around the world right now that when you piece them all together, it paints a pretty clear picture that there is an energy squeeze coming if our leaders don't get their stuff together and figure out a way out of this without shooting. You ready? Hit it. Thank you for joining me. I'm Jack Gamble and I'm nobody special and another day and another dollar in the oil markets prices are up again. The geopolitical risk in energy markets right now is getting worse and worse by the day. There's a whole bunch of stories going on right now and all of these things viewed together paints a pretty grim picture for energy markets. And even though there's negotiations going on between Russia and NATO and between the US and Iran, it seems like there is really nothing happening at the negotiating table. They're getting nowhere, and every day we get closer and closer to things lighting off. Now, before we get into these individual stories and look at some of the numbers in energy markets, I have to ask you folks, could you please like this video and subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell? It really helps me out, and I'd be forever in your debt. And now it is that time where we shrink my big, fat melon of a head and get into some of these stories. Now, I'm not trying to beat the war drums here. I'm not trying to make things sound worse than they are. I'm not trying to be hyperbolic here. I'm just trying to communicate an accurate picture of the geopolitical risk in energy markets and what that might mean for energy prices. And this story came out last night. Now, I was actually very surprised that this story resolved so quickly, but this is oil flow resumes in Kirkuk Sihan pipeline after Turkey blast. Last night, there was a large explosion at this oil pipeline that connects oil flow from northern Iraq through Turkey into the Mediterranean Sea, where it feeds into Europe predominantly. And there was an explosion. I want to read a little bit off of this story. The flow of crude oil through the Kirkuk Sihan pipeline has resumed after it was halted on Tuesday due to a blast near the pipeline in the southeastern Turkish province of something I'm not even going to try to pronounce, officials said on Wednesday. The explosion, which a senior security source later said was due to a falling power pylon and not an attack, caused the pipeline near, something I won't try to pronounce, to catch fire. The incident has added to global supply concerns and helped drive global crude prices to seven-year highs. Turkey's state pipeline operator Boda said earlier that the fire had been extinguished and oil flows would resume within an hour after all necessary measures have been taken by Boda's teams. The pipeline carries crude oil from Iraq's Kurdistan region for export through Turkey's port of Sihan. Now, an earlier version of this story that I saw did mention that falling power pylon, but said it was unclear whether or not it was related to sabotage. And the reason I question whether or not this may have been related to sabotage is because there has been a lot of similar stories going on in the Middle East lately. Remember, it was just two days ago that we had this story a drone attack in Abu Dhabi claimed by Yemen's rebels kills three. Emirati police said a suspected drone attack claimed by Yemen's Houthi rebels may have sparked an explosion that engulfed three oil tankers in Abu Dhabi and another fire at an extension of Abu Dhabi International Airport that killed three people and wounded six. Now, there has been a civil war going on in Yemen for years between the Yemeni government and the Houthi rebels. The Houthi rebels are backed by Iran and the Yemeni government is backed by Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and the Houthis claim credit for this attack, I guess, as retaliation for the Emiratis supporting the government in Yemen. And these are not the first stories this year. We had this story a few weeks ago where the Houthis seized a hostile vessel off of Yemen that the Saudis said carried medical equipment. Now, this was in the Red Sea, and it was on January 3rd. The Iran-aligned Houthi movement that controls northern Yemen hijacked a UAE-flagged cargo vessel, which it said engaged in hostile acts, but which the Saudis said was carrying hospital equipment. We've seen stories like this, where one side says it's carrying weapons or carrying terrorists. The other side said, no, it's carrying baby milk and unicorns and rainbows. What the truth is, who knows? But suffice it to say that there was a ship that was carrying something that was seized by these Houthi rebels in the Red Sea. And I just want to show you this map here of the northeast. Now, up here in the northern area of Iraq and through Turkey, this is the pipeline that had the explosion last night that sells oil into the Mediterranean where it can easily be carried over to Western Europe. And then you had the Houthi rebels attacking Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, and that is right here just to the west of the Strait of Hormuz. 
And then you had that Saudi cargo ship that was seized here right at the entrance to the Red Sea by the Houthi rebels. So you can see all three major routes out of the Middle East have had some kind of disruption to traffic recently. You've had the pipelines taking it out to the Middle East had some kind of disruption. You have had drone attacks here near the Strait of Hormuz, and you've had vessels seized here in the Red Sea. Now, again, I don't want to paint the wrong picture here. Every day there are hundreds and hundreds of vessels transit these areas, and every day there's millions of barrels of oil transiting through these pipelines. So for the most part, commerce remains unaffected in these regions. But this is a fact here. We've got this Iranian proxy. The Houthi rebels have now established a pretty clear pattern of targeting shipping and targeting the oil infrastructure, and Iran very closely aligned with Russia. This makes sense because Russia is using energy as a weapon with its conflict with Ukraine and with NATO right now. And on top of this, I want to draw your attention to this story. Russia, Iran, and China are holding joint naval maneuvers. And this is an Azerbaijan state news agency dated today. The Russian, Iranian, and Chinese navies will hold joint naval maneuvers, Russia's Pacific Fleet reported on Tuesday, according to TASS. The Pacific Fleet's naval group, made up of the Guards Order of Nakamov missile cruiser Varyag, the large anti-submarine warfare ship Admiral Tributz, and the large sea tanker Boris Butomia, is anchored in the roadstead of the Chabahar port in the Islamic Republic of Iran. In the port, the Russian Navy's official delegation will take part in a planning conference on holding joint naval drills of combat ships of Russia, Iran, and China, the Pacific Fleet's press office reported. And just to show you on the map, the Iranian port of Chabahar is here in the Gulf of Oman. That is to the east of the Strait of Hormuz, and it is very close to this Jask oil export terminal that the Iranians have just built. And that is of vital strategic importance because this choke point here, the Strait of Hormuz, this is where one quarter of all the world's oil flows through every day. And Iran has for years threatened to close off the Strait of Hormuz to choke the world of oil. And they've built this oil export terminal to the east of the strait so that if they do shut down the strait, they can keep selling their oil, namely to China, and possibly even to Russia, although Russia produces most of its own oil. I don't think they need it. Now, the fact that Russia and China and Iran are holding these joint naval drills, this is a big deal because that would suggest that if it ever came to that, to closing off the Strait of the Hormuz, the Russian and Chinese navies may participate in such an action in particular, they may try to protect Iranian shipping around that port of Jask, and that's why the Russian Pacific Fleet is anchored here in Chabahar, right next to that terminal. They could be practicing guaranteeing or protecting that Iranian shipping so that even if the Iranians choke off the flow through the Strait of Hormuz, the Iranians could continue selling their oil into China. All right, so you've got a lot going on in the Middle East. You've got attacks here in the Red Sea. You've got attacks in Abu Dhabi. You've got an oil pipeline explosion of unknown origins going on in northern Iraq. At the same time, you've got Russian, Chinese, Iranian joint naval drills going on in the Gulf of Oman. And also, while we're at it, we've got this article here on KOB4. Putin hosts Iranian president for Kremlin talks. Russia's president Vladimir Putin hosted his Iranian counterpart Wednesday, hailing the two countries' cooperation on the crisis in Syria and other international issues. So Vladimir Putin is hosting the president of Iran right as these joint naval exercises are going on and right as things are getting very aggravated in the Ukraine. So this would suggest if things light off in Eastern Europe, things in the Middle East could simultaneously ignite. Not good for energy markets, not good at all. And while this goes on, we've got U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken in here. This is in South Asian News ANI. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken arrives in Kiev, according to reports. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has arrived in Kiev. The CNN State Department pool reported on Wednesday Blinken is set to meet with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba as part of his visit. And while this is going on, we have the continued buildup of Russian military assets near the Ukraine's border. And this story came out yesterday, C-17 cargo planes carrying loads of anti-tank missiles arrive in Ukraine, courtesy of the United Kingdom. And I should note that although it is the United Kingdom that is flying these transports, they are supplying American-made Javelin anti-tank missiles. And here is a picture of those Javelins being unloaded from a C-17. Officials in the UK and Germany have pushed back against speculation that there's been some kind of diplomatic agreement between the two countries over a British air bridge operation that is delivering next-generation light anti-tank weapons or NLOS to Ukraine. 
UK Royal Air Force C-17 cargo planes began flying sorties to Borispil International Airport outside of Ukrainian capital of Kyiv yesterday, taking a route that appeared designed to avoid German airspace after British authorities publicly announced the planned armed shipments. This all comes amid simmering concerns that Russia may be planning to launch a new large-scale military intervention into Ukraine, fears that have sparked anew as Russian troops flood into neighboring Belarus, ostensibly for snap exercises next month. German authorities made clear that they did not ban the British flights from entering their airspace for any reason, and UK officials had not requested permission to send the C-17s over their country on the way to Ukraine in the first place. This was subsequently confirmed by the UK Ministry of Defense. And here you can see the route of some of these C-17 planes flying back and forth between Kyiv and the UK. Again, each plane is carrying these Javelin anti-tank missiles. Javelin is a shoulder-fired anti-tank missile. And if it comes down to asymmetrical warfare, it is a weapon that could at least partially enable Ukrainian troops who are less well-equipped than their Russian counterparts to defend against the Russian armor, although I doubt they would be able to stop a full-scale Russian invasion. They could, however, drive up the cost in both material and lives, making the Russians think twice before doing so. Now, obviously, the Russians are not going to like this, so this is one more thing that could potentially aggravate the situation. And taking a look here, this is West Texas Intermediate Oil Futures. And here you can see oil prices have pretty much marched straight up since December 19th. You know, we had that big sell-off on Black Friday with the unfortunate health scare that seemed a little bit overdone. And now prices have just been coming up and up and up as the situation in Ukraine has steadily gotten worse and worse. And things seem right now like they really are on the brink. They have been talking, and that is a good sign, but they are getting nowhere, and the troops just keep piling up, and now there's anti-tank missiles flying in, and now with the situation in the Middle East being added to it, it really doesn't look good for oil markets. And again, if this ever sets off, these oil prices are going to go significantly, significantly higher. And while we're at it, let's look at natural gas. Now, this is U.S. natural gas prices here, and they are down, and this really has more to do with the mild winter in the U.S. We did have a little bit of a cold spell last week, although that came and went pretty quick, and now there's warmer weather on the horizon. So natural gas prices do seem to be in retreat right now, at least here in the U.S. However, in Europe, prices still remain elevated. Now, this is the Dutch TTF hub, which is the benchmark for natural gas prices in Europe. You can see this ridiculous spike that we had in December, and we have since come down, and I can tell you this big drop in natural gas prices since December has nothing to do with energy policy. It was not U.S. LNG, although that helped. This is the warmer weather. Really, Europe has been bailed out by a mild winter. If things get cold again, these prices are heading right back up. Right now, Dutch TTF natural gas trading at about 75 down from a high of over 180 a month ago. And again, a lot of this has to do with these inventory levels are low and the Russian gas pipelines are not flowing like they used to. And I just want to draw your attention to this article. This is dated today. Eastward flows rise on Yamal Europe gas pipeline. Now, these gas flows are supposed to be in the western direction. Instead, we've got gas flowing from Germany back into Poland when typically this is Russian gas selling through Poland into western Europe. Gas flows from Germany to Poland via the Yamal European Pipeline, which usually sends Russian gas west to Europe, increased on Wednesday, the 30th straight day that supplies have headed east. The pipeline link between Poland and Germany has been operating in reverse mode since December 21st, generally adding to pressure on sky-high European gas prices. The pipeline usually accounts for about one-sixth of Russia's annual gas exports to Europe and Turkey. Reverse flows on Wednesday topped 10 million kilowatt hours per hour, up from around 9.4 on Tuesday and around 7 on Monday. So not only is the gas flowing in the wrong direction, but it is picking up steam, and they're saying it's expected to continue until at least Thursday. Again, if that weather breaks in Europe, things are going to get much worse much faster for European energy markets. So long story short, there are these little stories scattered all over Europe and all over the Middle East right now that by themselves maybe are not a huge deal. But when you view them in aggregate and you put them all together on a map, you can see a picture starting to develop. And it shows that if things light off in Eastern Europe, number one, it's going to spread to the Middle East pretty quickly. And number two, energy will be used as a weapon against the West, both natural gas and oil. And we're already seeing that through some of these proxy actions being taken by Houthi rebels in Yemen at the behest of Iran, 
assumedly at the behest of the Russians. And with these joint naval exercises going on between Russia, China, and Iran, and the Iranian prime minister flying to Russia for a meeting, obviously we see these countries coordinating their response, even as U.S. Secretary of State is flying into Kiev and sending these anti-tank missiles into the Ukrainians. So things continue to get worse, and they risk spreading, and even though there is some diplomacy going on, there are meetings being held, those meetings are going nowhere, and they're accomplishing nothing. So we can only hope that global leaders get their act together and figure this stuff out. Before the shooting starts, the shooting is not good for anybody. Again, I'm not trying to bang on war drums here. I'm just trying to communicate an accurate picture to you guys so you can understand what might be going on in energy markets and what right now is driving these higher oil prices. Guys, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and hit that notification bell. It really helps me out. And until next time, live small and dream big.